How's it going ladies and gents, my name's Andy, and today we're going to take a look at the Briley brothers. Three brothers, Anthony, James, and Linwood Briley. Basically, the three brothers went on a killing spree, but they eventually got arrested and sentenced to death. But before we get into that, I'll give you a quick background on who these guys were. Unlike the majority of serial killers or murderers throughout history, Anthony, James, and Linwood Briley grew up in a stable environment in Richmond, Virginia, with seemingly normal lives. But by the time they reached their teenage years, that would all change. They went from being normal high schoolers to being the most feared group of people in their entire town. The first murder was done by Linwood Briley, who used a rifle and shot an old lady across the street from his house. When the police found out it was him, he admitted to doing it and justified his actions by saying, I heard she had heart problems, she would have died soon anyway. Yikes. But because Linwood was only 16 years old, his punishment was not that severe. About one year in juvie and that was it. Everyone who lived nearby was aware of what happened, and although he was just a high school kid, it was still a dangerous situation. All the neighbors made sure to lock their doors and shut their windows, and they tried to avoid any issues with the Briley household. Over the years, the Briley brothers continued to have some… shady behavior. It was mainly from Linwood and James, the two older brothers. But by 1979, when the brothers were in their 20s, they started a murder spree in Richmond, Virginia. Over a 7 to 8 month period of time, a series of terrifying killings happened. And in total, 11 people were killed while over 20 people were injured. Some of the methods that they used to commit these murders were very brutal and crazy. One of them included raping and murdering a 76 year old babysitter. Another time, the three brothers ganged up on a teenager and killed him by dropping a concrete block on his head. They also beat up and killed a 62-year-old nurse with a baseball bat, and yeah, it was pretty bad. Eventually, around 1980, all three brothers would get captured by the police and arrested. Their accomplice, a man by the name of Duncan Meekins, was also arrested and sentenced to life in prison. The youngest brother, Anthony, got the lightest punishment out of the three brothers. He was only sentenced to life in prison, while the other two, Linwood and James, would get sentenced to death. They would get sent to death row, which basically means they would wait until it's their turn to be executed. So the two brothers got sent to Mecklenburg Correctional Center, awaiting their death. A few years later, in 1984, a man by the name of Harold Katrin was 71 years old and he was the head of security operations at the facility. Before the escape happened, Harold recalled a few things that were going on at the time. He said, It was unbelievable to me that we were in a position of having to allow death row inmates to congregate with one another up until 10 or 11 p.m. at night in the day room. Now, the problem with the Mecklenburg Correctional Center and a lot of other death row facilities back then was that the number of prisoners there greatly outnumbered the security officers. So if you let all the prisoners talk and hang out until 11 o'clock at night, there's bound to be some plans going on. Everyone there wanted to escape. They wanted to be free and leave the facility. Nobody wants to just stay there and rot away until they get executed. On top of that, these prisoners were the hardest criminals you'll find. There's a reason why they were sentenced to death. These guys did some legitimately terrible crimes. Anyway, Harold and the other security guys mentioned a few times that they were a bit worried. By spring of 1984, advocates for prisoners' rights became a bigger movement, and even though security was just doing their job, the prisoners saw it as oppression. Combine that with the fact that a lot of prisoners would give them some nasty looks and give them some death threats, and you can tell why all of the guards and security felt uneasy. Because they allowed the prisoners to talk basically all day, it was no surprise that the Briley brothers were able to concoct a plan with the other prisoners to escape. Harold also said that, Death row inmates are hardened people who will assess your strengths and weaknesses for years. They will learn exactly who you are, and if they sense any willingness to cut corners, they will take advantage of that. The inmates there were very smart people. They were aware of everything going on and what everyone was doing, because they've been doing that for years. 
And that's what they were doing when they were concocting this escape plan. They were observing everyone. The Briley brothers spent years doing things like sucking up to guards who were more sympathetic to make them feel more comfortable with them, and they also developed friendships with them as well. They even grew marijuana in their cells and spent years crafting and carving their own weapons with the ultimate goal of getting out of there. All of this, everything the Briley brothers did was so that they could escape in the future. And on May 31st, 1984, that was the day where the largest escape in history happened. Four years after, the two brothers were sent to the Mecklenburg Correctional Center. Around 6 p.m., about a dozen prisoners gathered at the front yard, but six of them quickly backed out of the plan because they were just scared. So that only left six people. One prisoner by the name of Lem Tuggle Jr. walked over to another prisoner, Dennis Stockton. Tuggle said to him, We're gonna leave tonight and I need to know how to get away from here. Can you tell me which roads run into North Carolina and where they are? Tuggle and Stockton were also the only two white guys who were going with the plan. Although Stockton eventually backed out because he was scared as well. There were a total of six death row inmates who decided that they were going with the plan. And by the way, this story of the escape is based on the account of Dennis Stockton, which he wrote in his diary. So anyway, about 8 p.m., all the action started to happen. Most of the prisoners left the yard by now, and some of them were waiting in Death Row's sea pod, awaiting their death by electric chair. But then, all of a sudden, one prisoner named Earl Clanton quickly made a move and ran into the bathroom. None of the guards even saw him. A few minutes later, a nurse passed by and knocked on the bathroom door, but James Briley, who was standing nearby, made up something on the spot and told the nurse that the bathroom was out of order, even though Clanton was still inside. At about 9pm, James Briley went to the control booth and asked the guard there for a book to read. And as the guard opened the booth to hand him the book, Briley screamed across the room to Clanton, and Clanton burst out of the bathroom and both of them strangled and assaulted the guard. Then the two of them entered into the control booth and opened all of the cells, where the rest of the prisoners were being held. In approximately three minutes, all of the prisoners overpower the guards and security officers in that area. According to Stockton, unarmed guards were stripped of their clothes, their mouths were taped shut, their hands tied behind their backs. The prisoners would wear the guards' uniforms to blend in, and every time other guards walked into that area, wondering what was going on, they would get jumped, tied up, and held hostage, just like the others. Eventually, they would capture a lieutenant, and the prisoners forced him to get a van so that they could use it to escape. They also collected some weapons, gas masks, helmets, and shields in preparation for their final escape. At this point, Death Row Sea Pod was completely under control of the prisoners and the rest of the building was completely oblivious to what was going on, because the buildings were kinda separated. However, in order for the six Death Row prisoners to escape, they must go through the main building. So, they bursted through the door that connected the Sea Pod to the main building and screamed that they had a bomb, hidden under a blanket that they were carrying. Now, the funny part was, because they were all dressed up in guard uniforms and helmets, everyone thought they were, well, guards. So the six disguised prisoners demanded that the officers open the gates, and you can probably guess what happened next. They rushed towards their van with their fake bomb and entered into the van and drove out of there. At 10.47pm, the two Briley brothers, Linwood and James, along with four other guys, Clanton, Peterson, Tuggle, and Jones, were free. There was no explosion because there was no bomb, there was no gunfire, nobody died. A few minutes after they escaped, the Mecklenburg facility quickly realized their mistake, and of course, the entire Mecklenburg county was scrambling. The police, the security officers, the guards, nobody believed that this was actually happening. But they were able to get a tip that the six prisoners were driving to North Carolina, and that's where the investigators and police and over 200 law enforcement agents were situated, trying to recapture the prisoners after that horrendous blunder in Mecklenburg. Four of them, Clanton, Peterson, Tuggle, and Jones, would get captured pretty easily and executed shortly after. But as for the Briley brothers, it was a lot harder to find them. After about four months of searching, the police were able to track several phone calls which eventually led them to an area in northern Philadelphia where they finally caught them. 
they would be sent back to Virginia and quickly got executed by the electric chair. The aftermath of this daring escape brought some mixed feelings. Even though they finally managed to capture the two Briley brothers and execute them, something like this should not even have happened in the first place. The guards and officers there felt ashamed, embarrassed, and how could they have let the biggest death row escape in history happen right in front of them? In the following years, the correctional center tightened up their security, hired more officers, and went through more training to prevent a disaster like this again. As for the third and youngest Briley brother, Anthony Briley, I mentioned earlier that he was only sentenced to life in prison, not death. And as of today, he's still serving his sentence. That's all folks, that sums up the story of how the Briley brothers escaped from death row. Thank you everyone for watching, I hope y'all enjoyed that video, and I'll see you next time. Peace.